Okay, we're going live. Okay, can we all welcome Nat Martin to his blue session? All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, um, welcome everybody, everybody here and there. <laughs> and, um, so uh, this is basically six weeks. You may or may not know, and this is the first week of six. Um, and this week, what we're going to focus on are um, it's it kind of the six weeks kind of moves uh, chronologically in terms of players. So this week we're starting with T Bone Walker and um, and BB King. Um, they were slightly kind of separated in terms of kind of T Bone was almost a generation before BB, um, but um, T Bone was one of the first kind of electric blues players and really a pioneer um, and influenced a lot of players that um, we might not actually be aware that he influenced, funnily enough. But um, he, he was a big influence on BB, as we'll find out in a minute. So we're starting that this week, um, obviously going into more detail in a moment, and then uh, from next week we're going to look at Albert King and Albert Collins. Um, then we're going to look at the Vaughan brothers, Stevie Ray Vaughan and also Jimmy Vaughan. Um, then we're going to look, we're kind of Basically, as we go through, we're kind of ramping it up to start looking at more of the sort of jazz vocabulary and blues um, as we get towards the back end of the six weeks. So in week four, we're going to look at Robin Ford. Um, week five, we're going to look at Matt Schofield. And then week six, we're going to take a look at some Josh Smith stuff. So that's kind of the basic overview of, um, of what we're doing. Um, but as I said, this week, we're going to kick off with um, some T-Bone Walker and BB King stuff. Um, uh, you guys ever heard, I guess you've heard of B.B. King, because uh, it's pretty hard to miss if you play the guitar, but um, has anyone come across T-Bone Walker before? Yeah? Okay, so kind of half and half, right, that's cool. That's cool, yeah, I mean, he, um, so he was kind of, uh, from what I found out, he had lots of his output from kind of the middle 40s, so 46 to 48. Um, 1946 to 1948. There's a particular song that you've probably heard of his that's called, um, they call it Stormy, Stormy Monday. She was say it's just as bad. It's, um, it's like a slow 12 8 blues. Um, and that was kind of one of his big hits, but that's, that's considered a blues standard. Um, it's been covered by loads of people. I mean, Albert King did it. I don't know if BB might have even done that, but um, the Allman Brothers famously did a version of that. Um, and they actually. Uh, kind of made the harmony a little more complex actually in their version in um, T. Bone Walker's version it's just a 1-4-5 blues but perhaps um, later on maybe when we look at the Robin Ford stuff we can kind of revisit that song and look at the slightly more jazzed up version that the Allman Brothers did because then we could look at how we would approach playing those changes maybe but um, that was one of his kind of probably his most well known song was that. Um, he also did Bobby Sox Blues, West Side Baby, were two of his other ones. Um, there was also, uh, hey man, who are I? There was a, uh, a song he did called T Bone Shuffle, which, is, um, which was on an album. I've got an album, I'm pretty sure it'll be the same tune. It's called Showdown. It's Robert Cray, Albert Collins, and Johnny Copeland. I think they did it in the 80s, and uh, um, they, cover it on, they cover it on that. So. That was kind of uh, one of his tunes. And yeah, as we said, he was one of the first to kind of popularize and um, play the electric, but popularize it. And actually in terms of showmanship, he had a lot of um, influence. So he was the guy that kind of influenced Hendrix to play behind his back. T-Bone Walker was doing that in like the 40s and um, you know, the back of the head thing. I don't know about the teeth. I don't know if that was T-Bone Walker, but I think the duck walk, like the Chuck Berry duck walk came from T-Bone Walker, I'm pretty sure as well. So. Those kind of elements of showmanship were all kind of stemming from T-Bone Walker. And if you think he was a pioneer on the guitar in the 40s, and he had Hendrix kind of 60s and late 60s as a pioneer, so kind of like 20 years later. But all that showmanship thing, T-Bone Walker was doing in the 40s. So, um, And I think it's, all, it's important to point out as well, Pete and I were talking before you guys came, and um, actually it's kind of interesting to look at the history of kind of electric blues guitar and how... Some of these licks we're going to check out, you'll notice that there's an inherent bit of jazziness about them, <laughs> um, if I can use that word, in terms of some of the some of the ideas and some of the licks, um, and also some of the way the way some of the lines move, as in they preempt some chords and almost T-Bone Walker was almost um, hinting at some substitutes at times, like 
chord substitutes, um, often like a, a dominant chord, a semitone above or below the target dominant chord. So if he was going to D7, there's a lick where he um, he kind of plays. He implies like he implies like an E flat to get into the D flat seven. Um, and we know that dominant chords dominant chords can move up or down with semitones. They resolve really well up or down with semitone, but um, he was using kind of little devices like that and then if you look at the history of blues and kind of how it went I think some of that stuff kind of disappeared for a little bit and now we've seen last kind of 20 30 years it started to re-emerge again and you know perhaps a little before that but and to be fair there were probably always players that, that had that jazz influence but in terms of mainstream guitar I think that that kind of jazz um, influence perhaps disappeared a little more um, maybe in the sort of 80s, and then re-emerged like late 90s, early 2000s a little more. With the exception of guys like Robin Ford, who were sort of always doing it almost. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, uh, the other thing to mention about him, just before we cover a little bit on BB, and then we'll get into stuff into licks, is that um, he had um, he had some really great technical facility, we were talking about that as well before, um, for a guy who, uh, you know, we're talking about 1940s. You listen to some of the, the ends of some of the recordings he's playing on, and he's playing some really quite fast licks and accurately as well. You know, you, you think this was the 1940s, and if you think about today, we've got there are so many help videos we can find online and all stuff about different techniques and you know, all the, the pick angling stuff and all that. And these guys didn't have any of that back then, they were just literally going on how it felt, which I think actually is a really good thing to always bring it back to in your own playing, like how does something feel, does it feel good, does it feel right, if it doesn't, maybe it's worth trying another uh, approach, you know, till it does feel good, because that, that kind of way of learning is so important, if it doesn't feel good, then something's not quite right somewhere, I think, but um, um, yeah, th th that was something I, I thought was amazing about him, just his technical facility for a guy you know, playing in the 1940s is, is pretty incredible. Um, so that's a bit on, on T-Bone Walker. Incidentally, he did come from a musical family and his parents were musicians and a good family friend was Blind Lemon Jefferson, who's obviously a very famous kind of country blues guitarist. So I think he kind of grew up with hearing all those sounds. Um, so just a tiny bit about BB then as well. I think, you know, um, King of the Blues, known as the King of the Blues. Um, lots of kind of hits um, with various people, in fact, over the course of his career. His career spanned like 65 years. I think he started in 49 and he, he, he gigged until he died, basically. I think he died in 2015, but his last gig was 2014, October 2014, I think it was. So a really long career and one of those guys as well, which is kind of similar to T-Bone Walker in a way, because T-Bone Walker was at the the root of that electric guitar thing. He's influenced so many players without them necessarily realizing it. But BB, I think, undoubtedly has influenced every almost lead electric guitarist, really, because I think the blues was really the first genre where electric guitar was at the forefront with playing solos. And then that obviously influenced um, rock and roll and then subsequently rock and so on. You know, so these. Um, these these early guys, of which BB is definitely one, uh, have undoubtedly had a, a big influence on a, pretty much every lead electric guitarist since, really, um, you know, through a, a third party or five. <laughs> but uh, certainly along the way they would have done. So tunes of BB Kings, which we've probably all heard of, things like the Thrill Is Gone, Sweet Little Angel, those are, Thrill Is Gone's like a straight eight um, kind of ballad thing. Uh, and then uh, Sweet Little Angel is like a 12-8 blues. We'll look at some licks based in that feel in a bit. Um, and then there are tunes like um, You Upset Me Baby, which is like a, a shuffle. Um, that was covered by Albert King as well. Lots of people have covered that one. Three O'Clock Blues, that's like a slow blues as well. Woke Up This Morning, that's an interesting song. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that. It comes to make you think. It makes you think that, but it's not like that. It's, um, it's like a rumba that goes into a swing. Um, but that's a great tune, and there's a there's a T-Bone Walker lick we'll look at, which actually crops up in that tune as well, or part of a little chordal idea. Um, and actually, uh, I discovered as well that 
I knew BB King was influenced by T-Bone Walker, but he actually met um, T-Bone Walker when BB first went to Memphis. That was kind of where BB's career started. I think it was a radio station called WDIA or something. I might, I might not have that right, but there was a radio station that he was working at. There's a very, very famous picture of him with a plaque of the radio station he's holding like an acoustic guitar. Uh, it's a black and white photo, you might see, he looks very young, he's got a suit on. And uh, I think that was around the time he was working there that he met T-Bone Walker and apparently, as soon as he met T-Bone Walker and heard him play, he realised that he wanted to be an electric player and kind of needed to get an electric guitar. So the two of those guys are really closely linked in terms of how they they influenced, um, well, uh, T-Bone Walker influenced Phoebe, but then I think subsequently on a later T-Bone Walker album, so T-Bone Walker died in 1974, I think it was, or 1975, one of the two, and on one of his albums, early 70s, one of his last albums, there's a track called, I think, BB King or something that, I'm not sure if he wrote it, but one of the guys in the band wrote it, he's obviously performed it, so there's obviously mutual respect there between those guys, but by that point, of course, BB's career was in full flight by the sort of 70s, so. Um, so that's a little bit of, of background on each of those guys, but we can see that they sort of cross over in terms of they, they met and must have played together as well. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention just about blues playing in general, which I think is going to be important for um, the next few weeks, but definitely tonight anyway, is that um, just this idea of how, you know, the great blues players, they're kind of using the minor pentatonic to uh, kind of outline the chord changes, even though, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily playing direct kind of arpeggios on each of the one, four and five chord, but they're just they know which notes sound good on each chord and they base their licks around some of those notes for each chord. And I think both of these guys do that. And um, it's particularly evident in some of the BB licks later on. But um, they also kind of embellish and, and tweak some of the notes. Um, and this is something I always talk about when I, when I kind of first start off a like a class on blues is this this idea of um, tweaking that that kind of that major third, which is a really big kind of blues thing. So if you if you take um, so the blues in B flat, just playing this B flat at fret eleven there, um, and uh, basically um, if my mic drops off. as well. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to hear me a little clearer if I stick this on now. Okay, that might be better. Um, so, yeah, basically a blues in B flat and if you play that minor third, which is the D flat, at, um, what's that, fret nine, basically you're just looking to give that a little tweak um, and that, if you think of like a, a B flat seven chord, um, essentially you're you're kind of trying to move more towards that major third so this is something you know that you hear a lot of blues players do but in particular bb is one of the guys that would um very much kind of use that major third and and or that minor third moving towards the major third and in fact on both chords funnily enough as well so sometimes he'd play it on chord four even though it's sort of hinting at a note that's not necessarily part of chord four. So um, you can be quite liberal with that, but I think it's good to know how that note relates to your underlying chord. Um, so yeah, this is something we'll think about. And also things like adding the ninth. Uh, uh, we'll see with T-Bone Walker, he adds the ninth a lot. And, and a lot of BB's licks are based around you know, like uh, playing off the sixth and the ninth. So the sixth and the ninth along with the root, minor third, fourth, fifth, flat six. Uh, sorry, flat seven even, not flat six. So just your standard minor pentatonic plus the ninth and the, uh, the sixth or the thirteenth are, are kind of gonna get you through uh, a lot of blues vocabulary, as well as possibly like a flat five. So, um, this is something BB would do, like, um, again, in B flat, we're kind of in box three of the minor pentatonic, so I'm 
hitting that octave and then just uh, playing an E flat and tweaking that slightly towards an E and then you can really pull that um, D flat at fret 14 kind of down quite a lot to get it to sound more like that D uh. and there's various degrees you can tweak that note uh. so I'm really tweaking it quite a lot there or just a little bit so depending on the chord you're on I guess that's whether you're on one chord or four chords maybe you're going to pull it down a little more if you're on chord one um, but I think these are all these are all things to think about like how you're using the minor pentatonic to outline each chord in in the blues and we'll see that a little bit as we as we go now um, <clears throat> so uh, let's why don't we turn our attention to a few of the Tebow Walker kind of lead lines that are on the the first page um, so the first one is like a over a blues in B flat it's like a shuffle blues um, and uh, essentially it's it basically uh, I put a little bit of description for each lick uh, in between the notation and the tab um, and it says this line is based on B flat minor pentatonic ish <laughs> but illustrates the ninth and anticipates the five chord that follows it um, T-Bone made extensive use of the ninth interval within his lines um, so if we just play this lick slowly to start with and then uh, maybe we can hear it with the chord um, so uh, kind of out of time almost or without the chords it's like one and so and then maybe if we can hear it, hear it with the chords um, one two three four play it again one more time and one for luck <laughs> cool thanks Pete cool so so basically um, you can see it's starting it's starting on the minor third but it's making use of this major third kind of directly and um is it something else I've noticed as well this seems to be there are only kind of certain players who necessarily use that major third directly. B.B. King was definitely one of them. Um, in fact, B.B. kind of uses it in a way that not many other players seem to in terms of like bending directly to it. But um, it, it's, it's used here by T-Bone Walker in this line. So he's playing D flat to a D and then playing, uh, so that's like minor third, major third, fifth and then octave. And then uh, we're doing this little uh, melodic fragment that he uses a lot, which is flat seven, six, five. So uh, flat three, th major third, minor third, major third, fifth, root, flat seven, six, five. And then we're gonna bend from the four to the five. So actually we see where, um, uh, Chuck Berry gets all these things when we start looking at these licks. <clears throat> so we get a bend from E flat to F, and we replay the F at fret six, and then A flat, B, C, F. Is that, is that kind of making some sense, that one? <clears throat> so, and this, I guess, this would actually work well as a, as a lick on chord one, but also on probably on chord five. F7. Yeah. Mm. And it works great on that chord as well, doesn't it? And then back to one. So it kind of works well on one and five. And if you think about it, um, it works well on one because we're kind of outlining the major third of the B. We've just got like a B flat major triad, haven't we there? But it also works well on the five because if you think about it, um, the first few notes are kind of opposite. They're like called one, not called five, but we're kind of uh, 
coming to, it's almost like a point of cadence within that leg around the F. Um, and then we, we go from an A flat, a B flat, to a C and end up on an F. So you think of that, that kind of BB influence here, but if you were to tweak that note slightly, just tweak the A flat very slightly, it becomes more like an A, which is which is in that in that chord. So I th and I think this is a great habit to get into, you know, taking a, a blues lick and in terms of running with that blues lick and trying to create more vocabulary from it, you can sort of say, how can I tweak some of the notes to make it fit the chord that I'm on? Um, so, so maybe this is a bit of a drastic change from it, but just to try and give you an example of how we might make that fit chord four. So basically before I was going, now instead of playing the D, I'm gonna slide from a C to a D flat. And then still play the A flat, G and F, which is nine, eight, six on the, uh, is that right? Nine, eight, six, yeah, on the, on the B. And then, and then I'm still gonna play the last part of the lick exactly the same. So the second bar of the lick is gonna be the same. Apart from the last note, instead of land, landing on a, an F, I'm going to land on a G. So I get... So I kind of, I connect with that, what would essentially be the sixth note from the B flat, which when we think of chord four, that's the major third of that, of that chord. I'm sure you've come across that, that idea before, the, you know, the, the sixth note being the major third of chord four. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good habit to kind of get into is just seeing how you can morph a lick to kind of fit each um, each chord. Um, so yeah, and, and also I guess there's ways you could probably elaborate on that. Now there's a lick we'll see in a minute, T-Bone Walker, where he's, um, he's kind of using like a triplet feel. So this is something, again, just in blues playing in general, it's great to kind of explore those those triplet ideas. Um, so this lick I've got, um, which isn't written down, but just to give you an idea of some other flavours. Hey Paddy, you alright? Is um, basically it starts on the B flat, and it's it's like triplets, so it's three notes against each beat. Da -ba -da -da -ba -da -da -ba -da 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 and I'm starting on a B flat at fret six, and then going to a C at fret eight, and then back to a B flat at six, so. That's the first part of my lick, and then I'm gonna play that little T-Bone Walker inspired rundown, which is A flat, G, and F. That's um, nine, eight, and six on the B. So. That's it, and then I'm gonna do the kind of, uh, well, the T-Bone Walker lit, but what we'd maybe associate more with Chuck Berry. So then I've got a bend from E flat at fret eight to fret 10 on the G. And then I'm gonna rebend that. So bend, play six on the B, rebend it. And then I'm gonna play E flat, D flat, and B flat. So that's eight, six, eight. Eight and six on the G, eight on the D. So. So that's kind of the lick I get, and you can, can we just play that B flat again, mate? Is that all right? So one, two, three, four. And one more time for you. One for luck. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks, mate. So um, there's ideas like that, that 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 you could use that are using kind of uh, triplet feel. Um, this again, uh, kind of T-Bone Walker inspired thing. It's very similar to the one we just did. But instead of playing uh, B flat, C, B flat, we're gonna start on the D flat and play D flat, C, B flat, B flat, that's not a note. 
So it's, it's actually quite friendly because then the finger shape is the same on both strings. It falls under the fingers nicely. So you can even add that on the top, like the... I'm sure we're all familiar with that. That kind of lick. So that's another, another cool thing you can do. Um, and again, if we're looking at trying to make that fit each chord, so chord, chord one, that could fit nicely over the, over the B flat. We can make it fit the F if instead of resolving to the B flat, we land on the F. So and then maybe we could go to like a, a G. Maybe if we just hang an E flat there, Pete. So We play the E flat, we kind of hear it connecting there a little more, or even we just play the same lick as we did on the B flat, that'll work because the, the B flat's the fifth of the E flat chord, so it kind of works as a sound. Um, so I think it's in, in terms of learning blues licks and building vocabulary, I think learning as many as you can is great from, from these early guys and any players out there, but then. Um, I think in terms of the, the progression of the way this particular series is going to go, I think developing our understanding of how the notes we play relate to the chords we're playing them over is crucial to then being able to make certain choices uh, in relation to certain sounds over certain chords, basically. So, so knowing that the B flat is the root of the B flat, it's the fifth of the E flat, and it's been like the fourth of the, the F, the five chord. <laughs> So um, it's little things like that, almost knowing how each note in your minor pentatonic or your blues scale kind of relates to each of the, th the three different chords in the blues, the one, four, and the five. That's a really good kind of starting point to get your head round. And then try each sound over each chord to see what the effect of it is. And then try and make licks using those sounds that you like within the bluesy uh, kind of sphere. <laughs> Well, you know, the bluesy sound, uh, still trying to maintain a bluesy sound, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so there are other things we could look at at that, but um, let's move on to this second lick. This is a really cool one. This is really weird. Um, it's a really wacky sound. Uh, it's using a whole tone scale, um, which you don't hear a lot in the blues, right? But in traditional blues, but it's kind of testament to the fact that, um, you know, a player like T-Bone Walker was had a really heavy kind of jazz influence in his playing or had some jazz influence um, so this is over like a, a d9 so it's like it's really weird isn't it so he just he pulls this out i think this is storm uh, maybe stormy monday i got this one from and he just pulls this one out, out of the bag and um and uh, again, if you know uh, if you know anything about augmented arpeggios, then basically you just you can play augmented arpeggios in whole tones in a whole tone scale, um, and then there are basically six of them before you get back to where you started, and every other one is an inversion of the the one um, two before it. So in other words, D augmented. If you go, if you went up four frets. This would be like a first inversion of D augmented, and then go up a, another four frets. That's a second inversion of D augmented, and then four more frets. You're back to where you started. Within position, obviously, you can you can do that a little more closely. So you can play root third sharp five root. Uh, sorry, third sharp fifth root, and then sharp five root third, and. Music's our ears, <laughs> but um, you can see how those kind of connect. But but should we should we hear this lick in context as well? Yeah. So um, so one, two, three, four. Okay. 
let's do it one more time. So. Let's do it one more time, back to the D. One more time, we'll get that resolution, sorry. So you can kind of get an idea of how it would resolve at the end as well. Thanks, Pete. Um, but yeah, a, a kind of actually quite a simple lick when you think about it because we're just the way I've tabbed it there as well. I think can be helpful in this situation. I've just I've tabbed it in a a linear way, basically, which um, you know we we can do it we can do it more in a position. If we wanted to, but there's something quite nice about playing it in that linear way. Just it kind of uh, rolls off the fingers quite nicely. So, um, but I, I guess that's an interesting lick to throw in there. Again, it, it definitely gives you a slightly. It's funny to say it, but uh, because I guess we would think of T Bone Walker being, you know, being active in the 40s and. 1940s as a more traditional player but it wouldn't necessarily be a lick we would associate with traditional blues it's kind of weird um, even though he played it as a traditional kind of blues player in a sense so but um, you know it's, it's one that makes you stand up and take notice so if you're if you're gonna play like a whole tone scale on chord five um, you have to play it in quite a strong way because it's it involves some some pretty some pretty, some pretty crazy sounds on that on that chord. Um, but of course, what you could try and do is basically just play different inversions of those augmented triads on on the D. Uh, so I, what I did was I just shifted it and started it from a different inversion of the D augmented. So should we, should we just do that over the D nine as well? Three. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And back to the back to the G. Um, three, four. So, thanks mate, so so basically, instead of, I'm just taking the next inversion up, um, but what I'd encourage you to do again in the interest of trying to build more language is just take any of these augmented triads, so you can play them basically from D, E, F sharp, um, G sharp, A sharp or C. Um, Obviously, you could call you could call the F sharp a G flat, the G sharp an A flat, and the A sharp a B flat. But basically, you can play them from any of those um, any of those notes. Um, so you could basically just try just try playing around with those, and then finding a way to resolve them back into the G. Um, so again, in the interest of trying to kind of build language um, from an existing idea you could just take different inversions of that augmented triad um, and uh, with an idea of you know trying to keep that initial kind of t-bone walker influence in there um, there's also the idea of this idea of kind of trying to play um it sounds a bit more wacky but like groups of four can be quite cool as well so um Oh, sorry. So, uh, so you could find something like this, which is um, so it starts on a uh, an A sharp or a B flat. It goes so uh, let's call it A sharp to a C, which is actually only a tone, or B flat to a C, D and E, and then you've got C D E F sharp. So. And then you're going to play um, D, E, F sharp, G sharp. So in terms of fret numbers, that's um, on the G, that's 3 and 5. And then on the B, 3 and 5. And then on the G, 5 and 7. On the B, 5 and 7. Then on the B, you're then going to play uh, 3 and 5. And then 2 and 4 on the high E. 
and then five and seven on the B, four and six on the high E, and then you're gonna end up on that B, which is. So, thanks man. So, um, so you can hear that, that kind of tension and resolution there in it. It gives you a slightly unusual bluesy sound, but it's like, a, I guess, a precursor to some of the stuff we're going to get into more in, you know, um, a few weeks' time. But it's kind of a cool sound to check out, definitely. It gives you a bit, bit more of a wacky edge to your playing, which you might, might be looking for. <laughs> um, cool. All right, wicked. So um, do you guys have any questions about those so far? Anything you wanted to add? Of course I've got, sorry, yeah, of course. Oh, thanks, thanks Charles. There we go. Um, okay, cool. Well, um, if you do have any questions at any point, please um, let me know. <laughs> um, so perhaps we should move on then to, let's, let's just go on to the, to the next lick. Um, so this lick at the bottom of page one, bar four, I think it is on the page. Again, this is like a 12-8 feel. So this is coming from a sort of slow blues kind of feel. Again, I think this one I probably um, nabbed from one version of, uh, they called it Stormy Monday by Tebow Walker, which we said was kind of his, his big hit, um, or one of, his, one of his hits that he's most well known for. Um, so this one's quite cool because it's straightforward enough, I've said here, this idea, but it utilises a semitone resolution by implying an E flat 7 to move into the D7. So basically this is a blues in G and it's called 1 going up to chord 5 basically. And um, But uh, on the end of the bar of G7, he kind of plays this... Um, B flat, G, B flat to an A and then to an F sharp. So it's almost like implying an E flat, which resolves into the D. Um, so it kind of goes, it goes something like that. And so the main run is just down a minor pentatonic scale. So basically you've got, you're in box one. Incidentally, I, I discovered as well with T-Bone, uh, a vast majority of his licks seem to be in, in box one, which is, um, I suppose, that's where a lot of that really great bluesy language is. Um, uh, and I think you see, you know, you see a lot of the great players are basing a lot of their language around that box. Um, uh, but uh, funnily enough, actually, with B.B. King, a lot of his trademark licks are kind of box three. Um, of the minor pentatonic stroke major pentatonic he kind of does a sort of hybrid thing as you guys might know if you checked him out we'll see some of those in a minute but um, this one's firmly in box one and it's just a rundown box one that first part so it's but instead of we miss the we miss the F so the flat seven on the D strings so we basically get root flat seven sorry fifth fourth flat three and then to the root, but then straight to the fifth. So, um, and then on the end of that, we've got this uh, these little intervals, which is basically like minor third to root, back to minor third, and then at this point we go to that, that D chord. So we're kind of playing the fifth and the third of the D chord. But uh, as I mentioned at the start, we can sort of see this B flat and the G as being almost like a, like an E flat resolving into the D, um, which again, there are several ways of explaining that, but basically it just sounds good. <laughs> so if you've got a dominant seventh chord, you can just play the one above it before you get there and it just, it sounds really natural. It's the same as if you do the one below it as well, so either kind of works really well. Um, excuse me, I'll just check my tuning one sec. Um, would you slide into that? Yeah, you can do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, if I, yeah, if I was playing it as a rhythm idea, I, I might well uh, use a slide there. Um, yeah, 
This kind of thing. So yeah, slides are slides are really nice like that. Um, but yeah, this should we play this lick in context just to hear this? So uh, again, it's that kind of one, two, three, four. And one more time, three, four. One for that, so I don't miss a note. And four and one. Thanks, Pete. So. <laughs> so you can hear, um, you can kind of hear those uh, those two little notes, kind of implying that almost that E flat seven going to a, a D. Um, so what I thought would be an interesting thing to do is again, in the interest of trying to create more vocabulary from that, um, uh, what have I said here? So implied semitone resolutions crop up often in T-bones vocabulary. So there's a lick in the minute where he kind of does that semitone shift into chord four so it's a blues in G and then he he plays like a flat five dominant nine to get him into chord four as a, as a ninth um, I think it's um, there's something about the guitar that's great for that because because we basically have the same shapes for all the chords if we like <laughs> we don't have to play those shapes but it just means we've we've got uh, an easy way to get us into the next call from a semitone above and you might um, you kind of get ideas like this um, so you know you get ideas like this that you um, I mean these these stem from kind of a jazzy approach as well but uh, there's a song called Love Struck Baby which Stevie Ray Vaughan played and that was a that was a rhythm part in that. At one point in the song, he would do, 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 do that kind of thing. And, you know, it's a device you hear a lot of players use, but again, it's just dominant chord resolution. They move really well. In fact, any chord moves really well chromatically, up or down. Just the nature of chromatics, they mirror, they mirror like a 5-1 cadence when you have chromatics. So basically, You know, you can just play it up and down the same chord type chromatically and it just it sounds natural because it's just moving in semitones all the time. But any any chord type would would work in that sense as well. So that's why that kind of idea works, because chromatics just sound very logical to our ear, I think. Um, but in, in terms of developing an idea like that further, um, uh, maybe we could think about more deliberately outlining that E flat seven. Um, so um, yeah, so let's try that. Um, should we do that little sequence again? Yeah, three, four. So. All I'm doing slightly differently is I'm still playing that uh, six on the low E to five on the D, which is like an e, uh, B flat and a what's that? A G. Uh, but then I'm I'm also playing a B flat at fret eight on the D string, and I'm going to the E flat at fret eight on the G, and I'm playing that D flat, which is like part of the the E flat seven, and then resolving to a D. So I'm sort of I'm actually using a little bit of targeting there. So I'm playing a semitone either side of the note I want to resolve to. Um, um, I think I did this on the end or something, but there are many elaborate ways you could find your way into that D7 from the E flat seven. Um, So, uh, so it all kind of stems on really um, digging into that D flat note. That's a, a really great way to really bring out that that substitution. 
If you're thinking about it from a, a more deliberate perspective of trying to bring out that E flat seven chord, but um, there's a lot of great investigations you could do into that particular sound to try and bring it out more. And the other thing to say is, of course, you can use that in your in your rhythm playing. So. So think about that E flat seven and sticking that on the last beat of your G chord. So. Um, so wherever you're, wherever you're playing, you're called voicing. You know, you you can stick that uh, stick that voicing in. So it's just like an E flat thirteen going to a D nine. Um, and you can play it more simply than that, I guess. So, so you can play it like this. So this is just G seven, moving that up chromatically, and an E flat for one beat to get you into the D. So, I think it's important to remember that any of this stuff that you look at from a lead perspective you can use in your rhythm playing and um and vice versa as well um and actually not to not to jump ahead too far but i, I remember that there's a video online of josh smith who we're going to obviously look at the very last week but he talks about some like he was working in a music shop or he was talking to the guy in the music shop and the guy in the music shop said you know you can play four to sharp four diminished back to five over uh, one over five and um he was like you're playing that chord why don't you then why don't you play why don't you play that arpeggio to kind of include that in your in your lead playing so i think that that was something that took me a little while to realize that that anything i learn as a rhythm thing i can put into my lead and anything i learn in my lead i can also put into my rhythm so i think that's that's worth bearing in mind because you can get a lot more mileage out of both your rhythm and your lead if you think of them as relating directly like that. Um, cool, yeah, so so that's quite an interesting one from the, the perspective of the sort of semitone resolution there from the E flat down to the D going into chord uh, five. Um, so uh, let's, um, let's check out this last T-Bone Walker single note line, um, uh, which is at the top of the second page. Um, Basically, this one uses, uh, you can see it's got like a C9 voicing. This is like, um, this is basically like chord four going back to chord one. So uh, where it starts this, this would be, let me get this right, five. this would be the end of bar six or bar six of a blues. So you'd basically have, uh, if you were blues in G, so that's bar three bar three, and then bar four, and then bar five, um, bar five, no, sorry, bar six. So you got bar one, <laughs> bar two, I can't count, bar three, and that's bar four, and then you're in bar five, and then you get. Oh, sorry, I missed a note, but that's, that's how the lick um, comes out there. So. It's basically the four chord going back to the going back to the one chord. Um, so yeah, you've basically got <clears throat> kind of the top part of a C nine voicing. It's on um, beat two and the and of two and then the and of three. So one, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and and then you pick up that G note. I've got that as fret five on the D uh, on the last uh, on the and of four. And then you, you're kind of getting this, um, you're getting this sort of uh, ninth combined with the thirteenth sort of sound again. Um, that's it. But you've also got this, this kind of chromatic, um, slightly jazzy thing, which again, you, I think, was definitely a trait that BB sort of inherited or. Um, used that that sort of uh, 
moving chromatically down from the fifth and then playing the fourth to the flat three to land on the three. So you can kind of play it over. In fact, I'm sure BB used to do that, thinking about it. He used to play that over successive octaves in that sort of a way. But um, that's quite a cool lick to play, you know, if you're on chord one, because it really kind of outlines chord one well. Um, but also, I, I didn't actually add this little tweak, but on the, um, on the F natural, which is in the, the third bar of that leg, He's almost bending it towards a G, so. It's that, that kind of um, sound again. Um. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, should we just play that one, one more time in context? Just because I fluffed it a bit the first time. Uh, so, one, two, three, four. One more time. One more time, let's go back to the C. Two, three, four. <laughs> Sorry guys, um, sorry that was my fault. Um, but you, you get the kind of idea of it anyway. Um, so, uh, <laughs> no, don't worry, no, don't worry at all. Uh, it's a confusing one because it starts in the middle, doesn't it? It starts in the middle of the, the sequence. Um, but uh, yeah, you can hear how as well if you're, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much playing all of that picked. Um, <laughs> Which, oh, it gives it quite a rhythmic emphasis if you play it like that, I think. So uh, it's worth trying like that, but also with some legato, I guess. It's quite nice with some legato as well, so you can kind of mix it up. But playing those triplets all picked kind of sounds quite cool sometimes as well. Um, and what have I said here? So both of these sounds are the ninth and the thirteenth. So it's those, those two sounds uh, were heavily used by T Bone Walker, um, which at times gave a slightly more sophisticated edge to his playing, like it, it kind of gave that jazzy sort of sound. Um, you know, where you get that kind of dominant thirteen chord. It sort of fit it went together with that quite nicely as a sound so um did i have anything else on on that one uh yeah it definitely made me think of um it definitely sort of made me think of chuck berry that one as well in terms of his uh you know the influence that t-bone had on him um <laughs> You know, if you think of like Johnny B. Good, um, uh, uh, um, oh. I think that's the start of Johnny B. Good. It's been a while since I played that, but it's kind of it's all that similar kind of language, isn't it? All these kind of um, ninth down the scale, almost like down a Dorian scale, but tweaking the last note to sound more like that major third, so it's kind of more bluesy. Um, so again, you can you can see the kind of direct link there with with, with Chuck Berry, and then, and then you think how much of an influence Chuck Berry had in terms of an electric guitarist and the the generations that he kind of. Uh, inspired as well so you can kind of see how t-bone walker kind of filtered through there and through various third parties almost um 
Okay, cool. So, so that's a few kind of lead examples of, of T-bone walkers. So we've, we've kind of had, definitely got this idea of using like the ninth, uh, also the, the, the thirteenth a little bit, or the, the sixth or the thirteen, and then um, also this crazy augmented thing we had, which was a was kind of a weird lick, and then um, we had this idea where he's kind of. sort of implying uh, uh, like a semitone chord movement from uh, into the five he's implying like a flat six as a dominant to get him into the five and then uh, yeah the last lick again was based on that ninth and thirteenth thing but with a triplet feel um, so the other thing to look at with his playing is like a few comping ideas that, that he used um, and uh, there's some really cool patterns that you hear him kind of use. Um, I can't remember the tune I got this from, but this was like a, a shuffle. Uh, uh, a shuffle blues. Um, essentially, it's based on eighth note and triplet rhythms. And the way I'm playing this for, that, for the pattern to get the definition is... So I'm, I'm treating the the ands as upstrokes but then with the triplets I'm playing down up down and then on beat four I'm actually playing another down straight away so because it you start to get more of that you get that group of three coming through a little more clearly and the three voicings he's using on this are basically, um, so he's got that, he's actually buying on the top there, so. Then he's going to like an E flat nine, flat nine, and then back to the B flat. Then he does like an E flat, which is like um, E flat triad on top and then just an F. And then back to the B flat. So, so you've basically got like a B flat nine with the root on top, and then E flat nine standard, standard James Brown kind of voicing, um, and then back to the B flat nine, and then for the E, uh, sorry for the F chord, we're playing like a four over five, so we're playing an E flat triad over an F. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of a nice sequence. Should we just play that in context as well? Um, so maybe one, two, uh, one, two, three, four. And E flat. <laughs> cool, nice one. So um, <laughs> there's a nice voice you can do on the E flat as well, which sometimes you hear the these guys use. So that's like a an E flat 13 with a ninth. It keeps the top notes the same. So. So basically you're just moving, you're moving those two notes, the D and the A flat down to a, whatever that is, a D flat and a G. And the other three notes, oh, no, that's not it. <laughs> the other three notes stay the same. You just have to jig your fingers around a little bit, but. So basically you've got, um, D, A flat, C, F, and B flat. So that's five on the A, six on the D, five on the G, and six on the B and the high E. And then for the E flat chord, you're gonna keep the top three notes the same, but play four on the A, five on the D, and then, as we said, five on the G, six on the B and the D. It's quite a cool, quite a cool sound. And again, you can play that. You can play that same voicing on the F if you wanted to.
around with those with those different voices essentially and that one in particular I think he uses behind it's almost like behind a horn solo or something and I, I, I thought it was quite a good tool for kind of building tension behind a solo because you've got like a repeated pattern um, it's almost like sometimes in some of those BB style blues or T-Bone Walker blues you kind of hear um, like a horn uh, line behind the solos um, uh, this kind of thing. So, exactly. So, um, uh, and it's almost like you're, you're kind of mim mimicking something like that. Um, uh, uh, and that can be a nice thing to do in general with, with your comping sometimes uh, in, in a blues. It's definitely something I. I use. I think of the one that I fall back on quite a lot. Um. Um, sequence that's called in there, I think. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was an odd one, it's not my fault. Um, but you get the idea, you can kind of move that, move that, those ideas around, um, around the sequence to kind of create some, some interesting comping ideas. But it's a good thing to look at as well, kind of how, how your different, different voices link together, and maybe a good place to start with that is just by oh. keeping a consistent top note. See if I let it hang down like that, it's not gonna put it like that. That's it. I reckon that's gonna be better. <laughs> Should get it caught in my teeth or something in a minute. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, you can keep a top note consistent like we were here. So maybe you could try um, like if you say you use like a thirteenth chord there, you could then you could have this for B flat thirteen and then. That's the ninth, obviously, there. And then um, go to the, uh, keep that note on top, which is a C, that becomes like the 13th of the, of the E flat. Back to being the ninth of the B flat, and then be the fifth of the F, so. <coughs> so you've got, you know, you've got that, that same note uh, consistently. Another, another one that will work well is having the fifth. Um, um, and then you, that will become the ninth of the E flat and then back to the fifth. And then it would become the root of the F. Whoops, that was an extra one. <laughs> so you get the idea just keeping that, that note the same. 13th will work as well, so 13th would be uh, obviously the 13th on the B flat, the 3rd of the E flat and the 9th of the F, so so it's like trying to find a, a little note that you can base all your voicings around because then that, that sort of keeps your voice leading smoother um, and it also gives your comping a bit more of a theme um, and you know that's, that's the idea we've sort of seen in that T-Bone Walker idea there, so if we're trying to roll with it a bit more that's one way we can sort of unpack it a little bit. Um, okay, so maybe let's, um, we should probably look at some BB licks in a second. Let's just look at the last one at bar 24 of Tebow Walker, uh, which is, um, this is a famous pattern that, it, um, what I've come to understand is that he, he sort of became, uh, or this kind of chordal pattern became part of his trademark. Um, so he, he would do this in kind of many tunes that he played um, and I guess you would kind of know it was him as a result but um, 
this is used by the Allman Brothers in their version of, of Stormy Monday. Um, they call it Stormy Monday. And it's basically like, again, the semitone shifts with dominant chords. So we've basically got, it's a blues in G. So we're playing a G, and then we go G flat, G, A flat 9, back to G9, and then the same pattern again, G flat 9, G9, A flat 9, G9, before we hit the D flat 9, which gets us into the, um, which gets us into the C chord. Um, should we just try that one, Pete, as well, just in, in context? So one, two, three, four. So it obviously creates some dissonance because Pete's just playing G7 in the bass, but the guitar, and you'll hear this if you pick out this idea on the on the recordings, the bass player isn't necessarily following it. T-Bone Walker's just playing it on the guitar, but it um so it just creates some tension because we're kind of getting this this sound, which sounds in isolation, sounds quite fruity, but actually in the context of a moving progression, it will make more sense. Um and then we've got this D flat on the end, which again is just an example of, you know, again, it just sounds good and it rolls off the fingers well on the guitar, but theoretically we could explain that, you know, G7 and D flat nine share the same functioning notes, so they both point to C. That's that's the, the theory behind it, but I don't necessarily think T-Bone Walker would have been thinking that. This was a, uh, maybe in, in terms of playing it in the moment, it's uh, it rolls off the fingers nicely, although, because he, there was some jazz influence in his playing, he may well have known what he was doing with that, but it just sounds good, you know, I think that's, that's the main thing to come back to. Moving, moving dominant chords up and down like that just kind of works. So um, a thing you could do is, um, you could obviously try that on any of, your, any of your chords in a blues. So, So then, you could do the same thing on the on the four chord, um, just to create that effect. And it would work on the on the five as well. If you had like two bars of chord five, you could try it on that. Um, and also the obvious one as well, if you're moving your chords chromatically, is to go from five. Obviously go chromatically between five and four, which sort of goes without saying, really. But again, that's a very common one as far as um, blues rhythm guitar goes. Um, and I'm sure you'll be able to find examples, again, of T-Bone Walker using that. Um, but that, that's a way you can develop that, I think. Try applying that idea to all three chords in the blues um, and, uh, and I kind of see what see what results you can get really um, and maybe sometimes you just do like a, a half a one as in you don't you could just maybe go um, I mean you hear this when you get like a walk up in a blues so um, You hear those semitones, don't you? Or maybe the other way around. So like, um, it, can, it can be either way. It can be a semitone above, down the semitone, or a semitone below, resolving up. So it just gives you little variations in your playing, really. And then if you think the different voicings you can use, you can use sevenths, ninths, thirteenth kind of voicings. Um, or I like nines, um, and obviously from semitone above, semitone above or below each of these. I like if you go, say you were going into C um, from a semitone below, you could play B thirteen and then play a C nine, so you kind of get it on top. 
which is quite an interesting sound. So, so. It's quite a cool, um, slightly more unusual sort of sort of sound that you're generating there. And again, you can you can uh, you can. You could try playing that sound on part of that chord, which is gonna gonna sound a bit odd, but I think sometimes something we don't necessarily explore, or or something we could explore more on guitar, are like our little fragment voicings and how we bring those into our lead playing, um, because. Um, you know, there, there's, I guess, there's a lot of. There's a lot of mileage for us to kind of bring these little chord fragments. Um, so if we were playing that D flat nine as he is in the in the rhythm part to the C. Um, can't play that. <laughs> There we go. So we could have like a yeah, cool, and then go back to the G again. Let's just go between those two. So nearly got that right. <laughs> you get the idea. Let's go back to the C again. So, got it right that time. Thanks, Pete. Sorry, my fingers all twisted up. <laughs> um, but you can hear that I'm just playing that chord seven, just basically arpeggiating that. Um, but it kind of gives me a lick. It gives me a lick that I can use to imply like a D flat nine resolving to that C. So it's quite cool that you can experiment with that stuff as well. Um, so. Um, Maybe what we should do is we've got we've got about just under twenty minutes, so maybe we should check out some of these BB uh, kind of lead lines. Um, the interesting thing about BB, which you you may well know, is that um, well he always said you know he didn't really play chords um, in his band. He always had like a rhythm guitarist and a, a piano player or you know organ player as well, but. Um, he could actually play chords. There's a there's a BBC documentary. He made an album, um, uh, kind of something in London, I think it was BB King in London or something. I've got a copy of it. And um, there's uh, they did some interviews uh, during those recording sessions, and I saw something on YouTube a few years ago. And um, he's basically been interviewed, and he's talking about his chords, but he um he can play chords he just i think he finds it hard to sing and play at the same time that was his thing and he was always quoted as saying you know when he stops singing he's vocally he starts singing on the guitar on lucille um but on this thing it's somewhere on youtube he's like he's all over he's kind of he's doing all these crazy chromatic things with these ninth and thirteenth chords and um like really kind of going for it um so i think he could play chords i mean and that sort of uh when you see that it gives you an insight into his like his understanding of harmony i think it probably ran deeper than you might expect it to in terms of what he could do but um i think this was certainly evident in his lead playing as we can actually see with this first lick so this is the bottom of page two is it uh or page three page three, three sorry thanks so bottom of page three and um yeah basically it's chord one going into chord four um so if we play the if we played the lick um out of uh, out of context a sec so it's basically um he's kind of bending from the fifth up to the the sixth or the thirteenth on the B flat, but that sort of preempts the E flat chord because that that note's going to be part of that chord, and then basically this is just. I mean, what notes have we got there in relation to E flat? So we've got we've got an F. How does that relate to an E flat as an interval? Ninth. Ninth. Then we've got an E flat, which is the root, a D flat. 
bat seven, C, sixth or thirteenth, and then a G. We've also got that in there somewhere. I missed one, but that's going to be what into it against major third, and then B flat's our fifth. So, so basically, he's just kind of outlining an E flat seven arpeggio. But he's doing it in a way that's not, you know, he's not, he's not playing it like this. He's just, he's integrating it into, uh, his articulation is bluesy, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So that, but it perfectly outlines an E flat. Perfectly outlines an E flat seven, but not in a sort of obvious way. It's like it's quite a hip way of outlining E flat seven, I guess. Um, should we just hear that in context as well? That one. So, uh, so one, two, three, four. Cool. So what he also does in that bar when he goes to B flat seven is he kind of directly plays that major third, or not quite directly. He bends up to it, but. And as we mentioned right at the start, there don't seem to be that many blues players that kind of do that that deliberately. Because sometimes a major third can sound a bit too kind of nice or happy if you play it directly on a blues. So, you know, you imagine if you've got... Yeah, so... It just kind of sounds... It, sound, it doesn't sound cool. <laughs> I don't know which other way to describe it, but it's just like... You kind of want to hear that bend because it's about, it sort of goes with the music in terms of having that, uh, you know, it's, it's more expressive, isn't it? Rather than playing it directly on, but, and it, it doesn't... It sounds a bit more melancholy, doesn't it? Definitely, yeah, with the... the That's it. Exactly, but I mean, there will be times when you'll hear again uh, Tebow Morgan and him play it uh, straight on, but it, it often seems to be played from below using a bend either from the minor third or from the major second this is a classic kind of bb um you know kind of classic um bb <laughs> bb uh kind of lick so um but it's, it's great that he uses it there and um he also does things like on, on the one chord. This is, um, again, if you've ever played around with any BB things, this kind of third box of the minor pentatonic, so we're in B flat still here, uh, is kind of where he's based, but he brings the six into it. And sometimes catch kind of uh, catches the string underneath. But uh, so he's bending from fifth to, to sixth or 13th, but he also kind of bends from five right up to flat seven. Oh. So those are the two bends he uses um, quite extensively. And also that, that bend from the four to the the kind of flat five, we'll see this in the next lick. Um, and uh, these little movements here, like a, from a flat third to the root, hammering on to the uh, second, to the sixth, back to the root. But, and like a double stop with the sixth and the root as well. So, so these kind of licks, so that's five bent up to uh, flat seven. And then uh, a little tweak on the, the 11th fret there. And then pulling off from the flat three to the root. Um, all, all little movements like this really. Um, and um, Tended as well to use uh, while we're here, like a combination of bridge pickup or like that middle setting. But 
on Lucille, we had like that. I think it's like a very tone switch or something. Um, I've never played one, but I've got I've got a friend who has one, and um, I think that was like a seven way thing or something. So he had a, quite a lot of variation um, in that. But on on these kind of guitars, you know, you've got like a you've got a volume for the, for the bridge, and then you've got a volume for the for the neck, and then basically those two affect the middle, so so you can get various amounts. It's not all that sensitive on this guitar, to be honest, but you can... There's kind of a subtle difference. You can sort of blend the pickups, so you can kind of get some interesting sounds and uh, using that blend. And sometimes he would have more of a, um, like a muffled tone as well. So maybe actually he did use the net pickup, to be fair, because I can... I've, I've got recordings where he's got that kind of tone. kind of sounds so maybe he did use the the net pickup as well um, but I think that is earlier stuff that kind of treble pickup um, very kind of cutting tone um, sweet little angel that song for example he's he's definitely got that sort of sort of tone going on um, if you flick over to the last page the top lick on um, the last page, which is bar 32, it's blues in B-flat, classic BB King, uh, outlining chord four, lick two. Uh, the previous lick we looked at was uh, chord four, lick one. Um, exactly, this again is just like a dominant seventh arpeggio. So, uh, and it resolves back to that B-flat. And it's like a kind of 12-8 feel again, this one. Um, so I've said this is another fine example of E.B. King's playing where he outlines chord four using his trademark selection of notes based around the notes of an E-flat seven chord. Um, this again closely pins down the sound of chord four. Um, should we just give this one a try? Uh, so one, two, three, four. So... started a bit earlier there but you got the idea so um, it's just it's basically an E flat 7 arpeggio um, literally that's what it is it starts on the flat 7 and then it goes root 3 5 flat 7 so um, again if you were if you were trying to expand on that as an idea You could just take, um, uh, here's a variation on that lick. Rhythmically, it's very different, but the notes are similar. So you could take just like an E flat major triad. Just like that, almost like that E shape chord, the top half of that. And then play, uh, so you're playing 13 on the D, 12 on the G, 11 on the B and high E, and then go for 14 on the B. And then eleven on the on the B, so and you could stick a um, a twelve on the G back to an eleven on the B for good measure. But it gives you a kind of variation that sounds very sort of BB. Um, And the other thing to mention about him as well is that, that kind of vibrato, which I can sort of do, but which is like quite, um, quite fast. So uh, that's another really key element of, of his playing. Um, but in, in terms of developing those kind of four chord back to one chord licks, I think thinking about, again, note selection and identifying that actually they're just arpeggios of the, the four chord is, is a way to kind of generate more ideas. Um, and just finding different variations on those. Um,
Uh, that's again something else he would do on chord four. It's just bending from the fifth up to the up to the sixth. Uh, because that really again that really connects nicely with with chord four. any of that a kind of selection of notes E flat G B flat and uh, what's that a D flat with the C in there as well these are all great notes to be to be hitting there um, crikey that's gone very quickly hasn't it uh, yeah let's just play play the other licks so um, so we'll play that lick blues in E flat very quickly um, so this is just a shuffle lick on like this could be chord one in an A flat blues uh, one a two I want two, three, four. Let's play that again. So that's the kind of classic BB thing you might have heard. And then uh, there's a bit of use of chromaticism uh, in the next lick, bar 36. This again is like a 12 8 feel. Um, so uh, one, two, three, four. Go. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Bit of a duffer there. Um, but you can hear that it's got that chromatic, like five flat five, four down to three idea. Um, and then the very last lick is like a turnaround lick, uh, which directly uses the major third. This lick's kind of this is in D flat. This I think this was from a version of Sweet Little Angel that I found. Um, on YouTube actually and uh, the thing with this one is that it, it actually doesn't follow the chords all that well but it's quite a cool lick anyway um. should we just play that one yeah one two three four so that's all right, let's do it one more time, that's all right. Two, three, four, one. There we go. So the interesting thing on the end is that he hits that, he kind of hits like a D flat six chord on the end of it over the, over the A flat chord. Which again, that's just really a BB thing to do, that, that, um, six and root he does that a lot on chord five so he almost implies like a, a sus sound on on chord five um just it's just kind of how he punctuates there's a lot of punctuation in his playing i think um but i think the, the main thing to take from bb's playing is that it is quite intelligent in the sense that the note choices that he's using really fit with the chord changes very well but also in some of his songs you hear like the uh, more of the jazzy chord changes and that particular choice of notes that we've been looking at so the root the minor third maybe tweaked to be the major third the the sixth and the flat seven and the fourth they're all notes that kind of fit really well with some of these more jazzy like uh three six two five kind of changes as well which you, every day i have the blues would be a great chat uh, track of his to check out to hear that but um yeah i think his playing is very intelligent and and stemmed from T-Bone Walkers and I think those two guys kind of certainly paved the way for some of that stuff that comes you know more latterly more recently with the uh the kind of more jazz influence stuff and for example Robin Ford will look at in week four I know BB King was a big influence on him um so it's likely that maybe some of that had rubbed off on on Robin Ford um but yeah I think we've managed to play through pretty much every lick there so did you guys have any questions to, to finish at all? Yes. Yeah. Shall we play? Shall we play a bit? You want some a bit of bit of playing, bit of playing action? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. How do you feel about that? Yeah, that's cool. Should we do like a shuffle? Maybe I, I, whatever we did, I, I take it. Okay. Let's do. Um, yeah, let's do a shuffle in B flat. Yeah. 
Nice one. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers. God, it's got warm in here.